Welcome to what's the 10th lesson from the Bible Institute's discussion about tough questions that people have about Christianity. Uh, this lesson, this discussion today is the question, what about people who have never heard about Jesus? This question naturally follows from the previous discussion that we had with Tim um, before this. And Tim talked about the fact that Christ is the only way to heaven. And once people begin to understand that Christ is the only way to heaven, then the natural question that comes up is, well, what about those who have never heard? Um, if Christ is the only way to heaven, then there seems to be dire consequences for the many, many people who have may maybe never heard the name of Jesus. And there are really... Um, three logical options to this question about those who have never heard. The first option would be that God won't judge them. Basically, that everyone goes to heaven. If they've never heard, then they are not responsible for anything, and they should get to heaven regardless um, of anything else. And the second option would be that God will judge everyone, um, and this would be unfair because people then are held accountable for a standard they're not aware of. If the standard is somehow they must know Christ and they're not aware of this and God judges them anyway, then that doesn't really seem to be fair uh, because people are judged based not on what they do know, but on things they don't know. And that seems very unwise and unfair. The third logical option is that God will judge people, and somehow this will be fair, this will be just, it will stand up to God's standards of him being a righteous and fair and just judge. And you could ask the question, well, if that's so, how can it be? And we're going to talk about this. Now, if you ask most people what their view is, I would say the predominant view is probably one, that people will go to heaven, that, um, that God judges them, and that that judgment is such that they should go to heaven if they have never heard of, of Jesus. Remember, we're not talking about those who have heard. We're not talking about what the basis of judgment is. That's already been covered in the previous topics. What we're saying is, if Jesus is the only way, which the Bible claims he is, which we as Christians believe that he is, if Jesus is the only way, then what about those who haven't heard of him? Because you're not being judged on things like your good works. You're being judged on whether or not you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. And most would say, well, those people should get to heaven. They haven't heard. Anything else would be unfair, I would think. And, and this comes down to what the real issue is. The real issue is then, is God fair? When God judges people, or if God judges people, is he fair? And if he's not fair, why would you trust and follow a God who is not fair? That doesn't seem to make any sense at all. So let's look at these questions. The first is that God, or these options, the first is that God will not judge them. And so everyone goes to heaven. Now, there are problems with this option, and we want to explore three problems with the option that people who haven't heard of Christ aren't judged. They just go to heaven. The first problem with this is that it would imply that God doesn't have any standards, that God really isn't just, that there's no accountability, and we'll delve into this a little bit more. Um, the second um, problem with this, it would, it would imply that we should keep quiet, that there's no need for missions, there's no need to tell people, that people are better off if they don't know about Jesus, because if they do know about Jesus, they're held accountable to that. And the third problem with this is that it's just contrary to Scripture. It's not what scripture would say. So let's look at these three problems with option one, that anyone who hasn't heard about Jesus goes to heaven anyway. All right, so this would imply, if it's true, that evil people would get into heaven, that God is not um, really going to judge people whether or not heard or not. Now, here's some famous evil people throughout the world. Um, I hope you're not looking at the picture up in the top corner. That person is hopefully not as evil as these people, though we've all sinned. But if it's true that any of these people have never heard of Jesus, then this option would say that they would go to heaven, that it doesn't matter how evil you are. If the standard is you must have heard of Jesus and you haven't heard of him and you get in any way, 
then all of these people would indeed go to heaven. And that doesn't seem fair um, or just at all. Suppose that you had um, a loved one who had been murdered by someone. Would you want that murderer to go off free? Um, of course not. You want justice. You want those who have done evil to be judged. And yet, if we um, say that if they haven't heard, they're not judged, then that doesn't make sense. In fact, you know, people have um, standards. God has standards. You don't have to tell everyone what those standards are for them to be judged. You don't have to tell your teenage children that when you're out for the night, please don't smash the furniture with a sledgehammer. If they, fast, if they smash the furniture with a sledgehammer, the justice should come about, even if they've never heard that that was a rule. It's something they should know. And so it really wouldn't be fair and just of God to not judge these people um, who are extremely evil. Uh, and so this is a problem with this first view. Another problem with this first view is that missions then would not make any sense. Why would we go tell people about Jesus? We're doing more harm than good. The missionaries are wasting their time. But yet there's so many biblical passages that say that we should send missionaries, that there is a value to missions, to telling people about, about Jesus. The Great Commission is that Jesus told people that they'll receive power when the Spirit has come upon them, and they should be witnesses locally to Jerusalem, to the surrounding area, Judea and Samaria, and even to the uttermost parts or the remotest parts of the earth. Other passages that talk about missions. In Matthew, uh, Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. One of the famous passages on missions is Romans 10, 14 through 15. And this is specifically talking about those who have not heard. And Paul asks the question, well, how then will they call on him, on Jesus, in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him, in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. What is Paul's answer to those who've never heard? They need to hear. They need a preacher. They need someone to tell them. And when some, someone comes and tells them, that is beautiful, good tidings, and the people who bring them, their feet are beautiful. So why would there be all of these passages that tell us to go tell people that it makes a difference if, in fact, they were better off if no one was to tell them? The third problem with this view that everyone who hasn't heard gets into heaven anyway is that it goes against direct scriptural teaching. Over and over in scripture, we're told that people will be judged based on um, their sin, not because they never heard the gospel, but because all have sinned. Romans 1, 18 through 20 says a, a bunch of things, but the core of it is this, but God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful people. They have no excuse for not knowing. And Romans 3, 23 says all have sinned, and the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. So, we're not judged because we have, haven't heard. God says he judges us because we are sinful, because we have a disease. Um, Romans 2 says, For there is going to come a day of judgment when God, the just judge of all world, God over and over is called just and fair, will judge all people according to what they have done. Not just some people, but all people according to what they have done. Think about um, a, a disease or something, or let's look at our, our current situation with the COVID-19 um, virus. People who die of a disease like COVID-19 aren't dying um, it, on the death certificate. The, the, death, the cause of death will be they had a disease, they had an infection, they um, died of the complications of COVID-19. Um, now, if there's a cure, they don't have to, to die, but the cause of death is not, they didn't have the cure. The cause of death is they had the disease. People are judged by God because he is just and holy. He is sinless. And his character, his character of perfect holiness must judge sinners. Not because they don't have the cure, but because they have the disease. 
The reason people die is that they have the disease. That's what it says on the death certificate. It doesn't say they died because there was no cure. And so this idea that those who've never heard should just get into heaven avoids the real complications. The real complications are that the judgment is passed on people, not because they haven't heard, not because they haven't taken the, um, the cure, they haven't accepted the cure, but because they have the disease, because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So the second option is that um, God will judge everyone, and this is unfair, because people are accountable to meet a standard they're not aware of. And, and this seems perfectly reasonable. Why would God judge someone in a way that we all think is unfair, that people um, would be held to some standard that they don't know? Uh, and, and so immediately we're taken back by this. Um, and indeed, what I will say is that if God did judge people on a standard that they truly had no knowledge of, that they shouldn't be aware of at all, then that would be unfair. If your kids should not be aware that they shouldn't smash the furniture with a sledgehammer and they do it, then to judge them based on that would be unfair. Now, one thing I'm confident of is that when people stand before God's judgment, no one will be able to accuse God of not being fair. God is going to be fair and just and holy in all that he does and righteous. And people will not be able to say, well, God, you weren't fair to me. And over and over again, the Bible seems to teach that God will hold those accountable to respond for what they know about him. Luke 12 says this, the servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be meet, beaten with many blows. If you know what you're supposed to do and you don't do it, you're gonna be severely punished. But the one who does not know and does the things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. For everyone who's been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who's been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. What Jesus seems to be saying in Luke is, if you don't know, there's still punishment. You still have sin. You still offended a holy God. But the punishment will be commensurate with what you did know. The one who does not know and does things deserving punishment, sin, will be beaten with few blows. Jeremiah 17.10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct according to what deeds they deserve. Now, we all deserve death and, and, and uh, judgment from God, but we don't all get that because of God's grace through Christ. But for those who don't accept that, it's clear that their actions will be judged um, based on what they knew and based on what they didn't know, based on what they did and based on what they didn't do. But that that judgment will still include punishment because they are indeed um, sinners. Now, one of the problems with this option number two is it makes three false assumptions. And we're gonna show these assumptions are false. The first assumption is that people have no knowledge of God. The second assumption is that people have no knowledge of their sin and their separation from God. And the third assumption is that God will not reveal himself to those who seek him. And all three of these assumptions are false. So let's look at the first of these. Let's look at all three, starting with the first, that people have no knowledge of God. In fact, what scripture says over and over is that people do have a knowledge of God. Um, that knowledge comes from two places, from external revelation, from God's creation, from what we call general revelation and what God has shown people through the world, and from internal revelation. That internal revelation is the fact that we all have a conscience that we know inside that that somehow is going to tell us that we are sinners, that there is a God, um, that we do have a standard to meet. Um, it's interesting, I was reading an article recently about this external revelation, this idea that nature itself demonstrates God, and you know I'm a scientist and I see that. And what this um, article was saying is that the idea of awe, um, being awesome when you look at creation somehow impedes science. Now, it was funny because their definition of science was 
um, avoiding God. And what they're saying is scientists often has this sense of awe and how wonderful and awesome the universe is. And that might lead us to God, which in this opinion was somehow away from science. And there was, they were saying this sense of awe is not something scientists should have because it says in their mind it leads to bad science. What they're really saying is it leads to an understanding that there's more than just science. And I found it interesting that even the scientists rec recognize that when you study nature, you see God in awe's awesomeness. There's this external revelation. But there's also this internal revelation. Inside we know deep down that there is a God. Blaise Pascal, the famous French scientist and mathematician said this, inside everyone there's a God-shaped vacuum inside every human heart that no created thing can fill. And people feel, feel that vacuum. They try to fill it with so many things, with material things, with pleasure somehow, with drugs or alcohol at times. And they feel, try to fill that void that they know is there, but they can't fill. That void, that internal revelation is telling them that God is there. You probably know Helen Keller, her story. Helen Keller was born um, deaf and blind and had no connection with the world. And gradually she learned to use sign language and understand and even speak. Um, but she says a remarkable thing about the time when she had no way to communicate with the world. Um, in one of her letters, she told Bishop Brooks that she had always known about God, even before she had any words, even before she could call God anything, she knew God was there. She didn't know what it was. God had no name for her. Nothing had a name for her. She had no concept of the name, but in her darkness and isolation, she knew that she was not alone. Someone was with her. She felt God's love, and when we sh she received the gift of language and heard about God, she said she already knew. This is what's inside every person. Romans 1 says that people suppress this at times, but we have an internal revelation that there's a God. So this assumption that people um, in far off places have no knowledge of God is just not true. People know there's a divine being, a creator from creation itself and from this internal sense of needing and knowing and wanting God. The second um, assumption that people have that's false is that people in general don't know they're sinners. But in fact, everyone knows that they have a standard they don't meet. Uh, Romans 2.1 says, therefore, you have no excuse. Paul is writing to those who aren't believers. Therefore, you have no excuse. Every one of you who passes judgment. For in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge, practice the same thing. In other words, we all know what's good and bad behavior. We judge other people. We know that there are those who are doing things that are wrong, and in that we judge ourselves, because we know that we do things wrong. We all have an internal standard that we know we don't meet. Uh, Paul goes on to say in Romans 2, even when Gentiles who do not have God's written law instinctively follow what the law says, they show that in their hearts they know right from wrong. They demonstrate that God's law is written within them for their own consciousness either accuses them or tell them that they are doing what is right. The day will surely come when God, by Jesus Christ, will judge everyone's secret life. We all have this internal thing. We all internally know what's right and wrong. But even worse than that is we all know that we don't meet our own standards. If you were to ask anybody, do you have a sense of what's right and wrong? They would say yes. And if you said, do you always do what's right? The, the answer is no. We all know that. Um, Samuel Johnson, a 17th century English critic, write, writes this, every man knows that of himself, which he dare not tell his dearest friend. We all have dark things inside of us, Christian, non-Christian, we all have that. C.S. Lewis wrote, we all fail to practice the type of behavior we expect from others. We all have our own internal standards we don't meet. Um, and Jesus says he doesn't just judge the external, he judges the heart, he judges the thoughts. Um, how many of you would want your thoughts broadcast on a screen, everything you think of for just 24 hours, all of your secret thoughts, all your secret behaviors, how many want that, want that you know, um, broadcast for 24 hours? Um, I would not. I would be ashamed of the things that I think at times. Um, 
because inside I know that I don't meet the standards that I even have for myself, much less what a perfectly holy God has for me. And since Jesus says that, you know, out of the heart comes bad actions, it's our heart, it's our thoughts even. Um, over and over, Jesus says, you know, how you think, if you, if you hate someone, in some sense you've committed murder, if you lust after someone, in some sense you've committed adultery, because God sees our thoughts. And, and both externally and internally, we all have a standard that we don't meet. Um, and, and this knowledge that we have, this standard that we have, should cause anyone to think, if I can't reach my standard and there is a God, then I'm in trouble. And this makes me need to find this God somehow. Um, Hebrews writes, or the writer of Hebrews says, without faith it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. I've heard testimonies of people, um, someone who was a Hindu, for instance, who tried so hard to practice Hindu religion and realized he fell short and realized that I need help no matter how much I try to reach a standard that I think is right, I can't do it. There has to be something else. And I think if deep down we know that we have a standard we can't meet, it's gonna ultimately drive us to a response to look outside of us for some God who can somehow help us in our time of need. And this leads to the um, third false assumption, and that is that people in general don't know that they need help from God. But I think if you know that you don't meet a standard, then you know you need, must need help from God. And if so, God promises um, to reach out to those who seek him. And over and over again in scripture, God promises that when people seek him, he will respond to that. Matthew 7 says, Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Uh, we already read, uh, well, Hebrews 11.6. Without faith it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. God rewards those who seek him. He promises to respond to that seeking. Um, Lamentations, the Lord is wonderfully good to those who wait for him and seek him. Jeremiah 29, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with your whole heart. There's story after story of people who have sought God um, and they have responded, um, God has responded to them. There's a book by Don Richardson called Eternity in Their Hearts that is full of stories of people who knew that there was a God a God that they um, didn't know, but who was out there. And the, the stories tell of God, who how he actively seeks the lost and how he actively has um, shown himself to them. Um, I heard a story from Lee Strobel about a country in the Middle East where everyone had a dream that along this road, there would be a car that would be passing through full of books that would tell about God. And this group of missionaries were smuggling Bibles into the story through, or into this country through a very hostile area and their car broke down and they were scared of, for their lives. And this whole group of people began um, converging on the car and, and they're terrified. And it's this group of people who had this same dream that this car would bring them books that told them about God. And as they passed out the Bibles, rather than their lives being in danger, they shared Christ and people were brought to the Lord. And over and over again, you see stories of people who know that they need a savior and that God then somehow comes to them and shows that Christ is the way. Um, more verses on this. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his and, and Jesus said, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The story of Cornelius is a great story. One of the first Gentiles to become a Christian. He had a dream that um, he was seeking God. And he had a dream that someone would come and tell him how to find God. And Peter had a dream that said, it's time to take the message to those who used to be unclean, the Gentiles. And God seeks and he saves um, uh, Cornelius. God wants to save people. 
he's actively seeking. Those whose heart turns to him, he responds. Um, Paul writes in Timothy, this is, a good, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to, to the knowledge of the truth. God wants everyone to be saved. That's his desire, and he's going to do everything possible to bring the message of Christ to those people. Uh, Peter writes, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness. Why does God wait to come back and save his people? Because that's what people were already saying in Peter's day. You know, Jesus should have come back by now. Where is he? And Peter says he's not slow, um, as some count slowness. He's patient towards you. He's not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And that is indeed why we are still here, why we are still waiting, so that others can come to Christ. So this brings us to the third option. It's the biblical option. It's the option that we believe is true, that God does judge people. He judges them based on whether they have heard about Christ. That is, um, since nobody can reach God's standard, we can only be saved through the blood of Christ. But God's judgment is perfect in a way that is fair and just and righteous. Why is that? We'll just review what we said, that everyone knows of God in his nature. Some have ignored it, some have suppressed it, but everyone knows about God through the external and internal revelation. Everyone knows that there's a standard they can't meet. They can't measure, meet their own standard. So clearly they must be able to meet, they can't meet God's standard either. Um, and they, they know that they, that's a problem. And then when a person cries to God, um, when they do, he will respond. Uh, God's judgment, as I said, will always be fair. Uh, no one will be able to stand before God and say, you weren't fair to me. Um, I don't know how this all works. Before Christ, people did not know the name of Christ, but God saved them through faith, faith that they couldn't make it on their own through their revelation they had of God. I don't know how much that corresponds to today's day and age. It seems to be that that... Um, that scripture says over and over, they must actually call on the name of Christ. Uh, John writes, as many as received him, to those get he, God gave the right to become children of God. Only to those who actually received Christ, through Christ, people are saved. Now, does this answer all the questions? No, I don't have all the answers. There are things I know that are true. Geography is no obstacle to God. If there's someone in a remote part of the world, a part of the world that doesn't have um, the scripture or too many missionaries, what's called the 1040 window, this part of the world that has less Christian witness, geography is not an obstacle to God, particularly in our world with so much um, radio broadcast and internet. There's ways to get the messages, message to people. No one is going to say, I, I wasn't able to hear. God is bigger than geography. He's bigger than the boundaries that, that we seem to impose. Second, God doesn't judge someone based on the knowledge they don't have, but on the response to the revelation they do have. I don't know how that's all going to work. God's ways are not my ways, as Isaiah 55 says, but I know it's true that in God's fairness, he judges people on what they know, not what they don't know. They should know that they need a Savior, that they can't reach it on their own, that they can't reach their and match their own standards. Now, finally, for someone who understands that, that Jesus has said he's the only way to God, that only through him can we have a relationship with the Father, the question is not, what about those who have never heard? And I think we need to always bring this back to the question is, what about you? You've heard the message of Jesus. You know that Jesus died on the cross because he loved you to save you for your sins. What about you? If someone was dying of cancer, they wouldn't reject a cure because someone in a far off land doesn't have the cure. If someone's dying of cancer and they have the cure, they know the cure, they would take it for themselves and then take it to those who don't have it. People have a, a, a disease, sin, we're separated from God. And if someone knows the cure that Christ has come to save them, the question is, what about you? Don't reject that because of someone in a far off land who hasn't heard. Um, accept the cure, accept Christ, have a relationship with him, 
Um, and that's the real question. So as someone brings up this question, I think it's important that we have good answers to those people, but it's also important that we bring it back to the fundamental question, what about you? What are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to rely on for your eternal destiny?